die, go home. Number 42. This morning's scripture reading will be Matthew 26, verse 41. Matthew 26, verse 41. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Yeah, this passage, I want to talk about this, um, and I put it up on the screen a little bit differently. Um, but we need to watch and pray because flesh is powerless. The flesh is not going to overcome temptation 100% of the time. It really doesn't matter how strong somebody is, how strong-willed they are. Um, if you put a, a really great temptation in front of them, um, they're not going to say no to that temptation 100% of the time. And so I used uh, in the teen class a while back, you know, whatever their favorite uh, dessert was. And you put it on the counter in your house and you walk by it and you say, well, ask how, I asked all of them to give a percentage in their, in their thoughts, how often would, could you, you know you shouldn't, but it's there every time you walk by, how many times, what percentage of the times would you say no? You know, somewhere as low as 50-50. Um, I think about as high, you know, as it got, uh, you know, for me it was maybe 75 to 90%. But I'm not gonna say no every time, especially if, you know, if, if I'm down at one point, you know, if I'm, if I'm feeling frustrated or upset, those, all of those factors are going to cause me to give in to the temptation. And so if I know there's something I shouldn't have, then I, having it on my counter doesn't help me. I need to be watchful and I need to remove that from the house so it's not near me. That's why, you know, scriptures talk about sexual immorality in a way that it says, if it's in front of you or near you, you need to run from it. You, you don't just keep it nearby. You have to get away from it. You have to have it not close. Because nobody, nobody is going to uh, withstand that temptation all the time. And this is what he's talking about. And, you know, in this, in this example, Jesus is about to be arrested. He knows that. The rest of the, his apostles don't. But he goes out after they've been in the upper room where he instituted the Lord's Supper and gave them those commands. And as they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane there, the Mount of Olives, and he asked Peter, James, and John to go a little farther with him. And he asked them, I would like you to watch with me. And then he went a little further to pray on his own. But he basically asked them to be his watchmen. He wanted them to be alert to see what was happening. But they, uh, but they weren't aware of what was about to take place. They didn't know Judas had left and was bringing guards with him in the near future to arrest him. Jesus knew that, but they didn't know that. And as they sat there in the evening, tired, I mean, after all, they'd listened to Jesus for how many hours that night? I don't know. I hear people say, you know, 30 to 45 minutes tires you all out. But... It's like, and so, and for, for all of us, you know, reading at night, doing something at night, our body, even if we want to stay awake sometimes, we can't. And so he takes this opportunity to basically teach them a principle that they have to be really careful and on alert for temptation because their flesh isn't going to overcome it. It's too weak. Now, he did not teach them, you need to strengthen your flesh to be stronger. That's just not going to happen. Your flesh will never be strong enough to overcome all temptations it has. You will never have a strong enough will to overcome all temptations you have. 
you need to be careful to not let temptations near you. And you need to pray about overcoming them when they, do, when they are near. And so he's trying to help us overcome the weakness that is in this we'd like to live. We've committed our life to Christ. We'd like to do the right thing. We'd like to um, live for him. But why don't we do it all the time? And most of the time, it has to do with our flesh. And it, because our flesh affects us in all kinds of ways, our flesh needs sleep. That's why these guys are falling asleep, right? They're tired. And that's what happens to the body when it's tired. It will fall asleep. But our, our body needs food. Our body needs rest. Our body responds to all of the stimuli that exists in our life. Whether it's too much stress, we're going to get overcome with anxiety, fear. If it's all, any numerable, and, and, and that anxiety and fear leads to all kinds of other physical ailments and problems, mentally and emotionally. You can't think as well. You can't think as clearly. And so... He wants them to know you have a problem in this arrangement of trying to walk with God. And it is your flesh. That's really why in Romans chapter 7, Paul ultimately is asking, who's going to deliver me from this corpse? That's really what he asks. Is this dead body, this, this flesh that is dying, who's going to help me overcome this? Because I can't do it. My will isn't strong enough. And that's what he is telling them. And so he says, because your flesh is so weak and powerless, you need to really be alert for when temptation is coming. Now, the same temptation isn't for everybody. Not everybody has the exact, same exact temptation. Some people have a real sweet tooth. Other people, they like, ah, don't really like sweet that much. They might, you know, they might like salt and chips or something. Prefer that over a cupcake. Whatever your temptation is, it's going to be different from person to person. And yet all of us face the exact same things that are common throughout humanity. None of us have any kind of unique temptation that others don't have. We're all in the same boat here. And just like they were, and that's why he warned them. He gave them in the, in the midst of, think about this, in the midst of him praying about what he's about to endure, to be arrested and beaten and tried through the night until he's crucified in the morning. In the midst of that, he stops for a moment to teach Peter, James, and John this lesson. Now, I kind of suspect he knows they're going to fall asleep. He knows they're tired, and he wants to give them this lesson. He says, your flesh isn't strong enough. You need to be alert and watchful, and you need to pray. So when they were there, what could they have done? Let's say they were all three of them tired, and they're the ones that are all, excuse me, on watch. I don't know, what, what do people do when they have to be up late at night on watch? Military people might know the answer to some of those questions. But if you have multiple people, right, you're going to help each other, aren't you? You're going to keep each other awake, keep each other alert. You're going to get hooked on coffee or some other kind of caffeine substance. Hopefully just caffeine substances. A lot of people who work nights and other difficult hours end up getting hooked on all kinds of other substances to try and maintain alertness. It's common because you're doing something, you're trying, you know that's going to be a problem. And so you take and you, you make plans to overcome that problem. And that's what he's trying to get us to do. And I'm saying this as part of a response to what I talked about last week. And that is my overview of Ephesians, a heart enlightened by hope and love through faith, prepared for trouble, walking humbly and gently together in truth and love. That is my single sentence 
summation of the book of Ephesians. I don't know if you, you might notice there are two added words to it. As I thought, as I thought of last week's, I thought, you know, I could improve that. And I'll let you figure out what those two words are that I added from last week. But that's what the goal is. That's what abounding in hope is about. That we are abounding in hope that we have perceived and experienced the love of God and that we walk humbly and gently together and, and our actions and our words all they all function in Christ, in God, practicing his goodness and his righteousness. And that's the goal, right? That, that is the target for all of us throughout life. The problem is, and this is where the prepared for trouble comes, is in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. When at the end, after he's taught them about, you know, the, the, the glorious hope that we have and, and the love of God and, and the faith and that we walk together uh, in Christ. He said, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So he tells them, the devil is going to be after you. If you're trying to walk with God, the devil doesn't not care. And he has schemes that he has worked throughout humanity, throughout history, to tempt us, to deceive us, to defraud us, to lie to us, and make us believe things that aren't true so that we will fall. And we will be devoured. That we will be separated from God. Because after all, I mean, the devil is just can't wait to accuse somebody. You know, like Job, when he goes before God and says, well, you know, the only reason he walks and, and follows you is because you take care of him. But you didn't take care of him that way, he wouldn't follow you. He wouldn't walk with you. He wants to accuse. That, that's who he is. He is the adversary. And so, to be prepared for all of those schemes, uh, and that's really what I want to focus on for a little bit, uh, for the next number of weeks, some of those things that are his schemes, because there is a number of them that are mentioned in Scripture. And I'm going to talk about uh, one of them, probably two of them today. And so, let's turn over first to 1 Peter chapter 5. And we're going to look at 6 through 11. Um, so in, in Peter's first letter, you know, he is talking about uh, suffering for Christ and how and it's kind of a common theme of it, um, that they are, they are enduring difficulties. He's encouraging them that they need to suffer. They need to be good stewards of all that God has given them. Um, and then he has exhorted all the, the elders to, to also endure, to, uh, to clothe themselves um, with humility. And then he encourages everybody to be humble towards one another. And then he says, starting in verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so one of the things that it talks about here in, the, in this passage is that the devil, he, he likens to a, a roaring lion. I've heard the story, you know, that um, <laughs> the devil, that, that 
that lions roar to kind of scare the prey. I've also read that that doesn't happen. So I don't know. It sounds like a good story anyway. But uh, so kind of I've read a lot of biologists about the purpose of lions roaring. But I will say the one thing, having experienced a number of lion prides roaring uh, in Arizona, really, uh, really cool wildlife uh, preserve kind of east uh, of Phoenix, um, the valley there. And I was there at, uh, lions have a tendency to roar at night, by the way. They do a lot of the hunting at night. Um, and their roaring has a number of, of reasons for it. Um, they can actually tell numbers. So one pride roars, another pride roars. And, and so if they hear roaring of, of, of a pride nearby, they, one pride will decide whether to roar or not based on the numbers they heard. And if it's more than them, they don't respond. <laughs> they won't roar. But if it's, if, if it's less, then they'll roar. And so, you know, they, they're, there's a competition going on. So I was there uh, at dusk one evening uh, with the family. And, and they, the pride, there's multiple prides there, and he started roaring. And it really is almost no sound. I don't know, maybe, maybe some dogs <laughs> growling or something, but there's almost no sound that as, is as terrifying and visceral as lions roaring near you. <laughs> it, it, is, it is just frightening. And there's no wonder that animals who hear, hear that would, would be terribly anxious, right? Prey animals do respond sometimes, and I guess there are some instances where, it, where they will roar to try and trick prey, um, make it easier. Typically, uh, from what I've read, is that in the real world, bi biologically, a, a prey animal will be much better off running towards a roar because the roar usually means the stalking ones that are about to eat them are someplace else. <laughs> They're on another side of them, where they're going to ca capture them. So the roar, might, the roar might get them to flee right into the awaiting uh, uh, female lions, who do most all the hunting. And so, but a lion's roar is terrifying. And, and, and if we heard it all the time, we'd be terrified, right? And, and people who live near lions, they, they live in protected communities. They protect their communities from, from lions. And we would do the same thing. But the problem for a lot of us is we don't hear the roaring of the Satan. We don't see it. We don't experience it in that visceral way. But what, and so we have to have enlightened eyes and hearts that understand he is really doing that. Even though we don't hear it. We need to have fear about the temptations that the devil and that has for us and the schemes that uh, he has started in this world. And so one of those talks about, and we're going to look at another passage here and kind of see it as well. But he says, you know, you need to cast all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And he says, you need to resist him. You need to be firm in your faith, knowing that you're not suffering these things alone. But that you might have to endure it and suffer through it for a while before the times come that you will be strengthened. We might have to resist for a bit of, a bit of time. And so I want to, as we're going to look in this next section, the idea of fear and isolation and the other thing that comes up is sorrow. And we're going to see that in this next example um, that also talks about the devil's kind of schemes. And that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to, I'm going to kind of combine uh, what each of them says into a kind of a summation here in a moment. But we can do it. in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, um, it starts really in verse 5, but he, it talks about forgiving the sinner. Somebody that they have punished, the church has punished somebody, and he's going to encourage them 
to do something. Now, it's thought, and it's generally kind of thought, that the person that is being talked about here that's been punished by the church is the person from the first Corinthians chapter 6. And that, that seems most likely, whether it's exactly that person or not, it doesn't really matter. The point remains exactly the same, regardless of who it might be. But he says, if anyone has caused you pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to be put it too severely to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So he's been punished. And, and Paul, especially if it's that person in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul has certainly, he certainly merited the punishment. And Paul's not saying he didn't. But he's saying if you punish and they are overwhelmed by the sadness and sorrow, and, and I think you can see even isolation from the rest of the group, that that will have a terrible effect. And that's not what you're trying to do when you punish or when you discipline somebody. You're not trying to cut them off and throw them away. You're trying to have a response that allows you to be united again. And so he tells them, you need to forgive and you need to comfort, or he may be overwhelmed by the success of sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. I remember when I was a, a young man and uh, a friend of mine, uh, his kids and he was telling me a little bit about you know when he would um, punish them um, and, and how each of them responded um, you know one of them was, was real analytical and you know arguing about you know they were right and their punishment was wrong and another one was, was super stubborn and, and didn't he's like I'm never going to except crying. I'm never going to act like I am hurt by anything you've done. And then a third one was like, you, you looked at me a little side eye and now I'm bawling and I need you to hug me. <laughs> right. And so he had all, he had all those and he, um, but he did say really all three of them, even though they each had kind of their own ways of, of being, how they reacted to punishment, all of them needed to know that he loved them after he punished them. That they had to know that. The punishment wasn't, I hate you, and I'm mad at you, I'm frustrated at you. The thing is, I did this, I punished you because you deserved it, and you need to learn the lessons that this is inappropriate and unacceptable behavior. But it was all done because I love you. And that is exactly why God punishes us, doesn't he? Why would God discipline us and correct us and try to get us to do the right things if he didn't love us? He goes, well, that's whatever. They'll, they'll be cut off from me and go on to hell. That'd be okay. That's not okay with God because he loves us. And so he's warning them that you can't be so harsh that you don't tell them that you love them. And he says, for this is why I wrote, that I may test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Now he says we're not ignorant of his designs, but remember, he's telling them how to overcome something that would be one of Satan's designs. And that is to isolate and to make people afraid and anxious and full of sorrow so that they are overwhelmed and give up. That's what he's warning them why it's so important that they reaffirm their love, why they, why they forgive. And sometimes people do things that are hard to forgive. 
And if it's a person in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you can understand how that would be pretty hard to forgive. But it's still necessary so that people don't become devoured through their own isolation and anxieties and fears and their own sadness and overwhelmed by basically the troubles. That part of the reason that we are trying to walk enlightened, with enlightened hearts and that we're not doing it alone, but that we're doing it together. Because alone, we're not going to make it. We need each other for, to accomplish what God wants. We need each other to keep lifting each other up. Because at different times in our lives, each of us are going to be down. And at times, we're going to be up. We're going to be strong and we're going to be weak in different moments and different times in our lives. And we're going to need other people. So if we're the strong ones, others around us are needing us. And if we're the weak ones, then we need others who are strong around us. And so when we think about this idea of being devoured, having the fear that Satan is like this lion roaring and terrifying us, and, and when you hear it and when you're around it, it's really clear if there wasn't a big fence separating you from them, you have no hope against them. Without some sort of a weapon, they're going to kill you. Human beings, we're not, we're not strong enough, we're not fast enough. We have only one chance, and that is to develop tools and or weapons or groups big enough that to try and keep them from from us and we need the exact same thing to pre- we're not big enough strong enough smart enough to prevent the devil from getting to us he will get to every single one of us if we are not careful if we're not watchful if we're not alert to recognizing what are my temptations and where are they most likely to occur? What are the things that I struggle with? Every single person probably right now could write down a, a list of them. I don't know how long your list would be, but every one of us you could probably write down a list of things that, well, you know, these, are my, these are the things that I struggle with. Either whether it's doing things I shouldn't or not doing the things I should. What are the things that tempt me? And what's your plan? How can you be watchful and alert for those temptations? How can you plan to overcome those temptations? Because you're not going to be strong enough all the time to overcome them. It's a little bit like people, people who have kind of addiction issues, you know, who become enslaved really to something um, in this world. If for them to successfully rehabilitate themselves, to, to find a way to, you know, stop drinking or stop doing drugs or stop something else, they almost always need other people. They need people who know they're going through it that they can reach out to and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling. Or they need to figure out ways to keep it away from them. So, you know... Alcoholics and drug addicts usually have to leave friends. You usually cannot keep the same friends if you will, because when you're a drug addict or you're an alcoholic, you had friends who enabled all that. Maybe they did it with you. And the only way to be sober, usually, and I, so I won't say every time, but the only ones I know of, had to leave all those friends behind who were involved in that practice. And everyone, every time somebody got clean and tried to go back and have those friends, they fell. Because those friends were the ones also tempting. And so, for all of us to understand, we're really in the same boat as any addict. Sin is addictive. All different kinds of sin is addictive. And for us to overcome temptation and sin itself, 
we need to have situations, we need to have certain things laid out in our life so that we don't put those temptations near us. So that we watch and we go, where, where is that temptation going to come from? And I'm going to stay away from that, aren't I? If I'm watchful. But if I go about without being careful, without being kind of on alert, then I'm going to get tripped up. And you know when I'm really going to get tripped up and fall the hardest? Is when I'm feeling super confident like nothing's going to do anything to me. And that's when I'm really at dang, great danger for tripping and falling. And so for all of us, and I'll leave you with these last few. Because this is kind of what I get from all of it, especially from First Peter there. Humble yourselves. And I, and I take that to mean don't think you're strong enough to overcome temptation on your own, without God, and without help. Your willpower will not be strong enough to overcome the temptation of your flesh. Love one another. Care for one another. Take care of each other. Look out for each other. And see, try to notice if the other people are struggling. So that we, you know, we, we talk about, we come together to, you know, in the Lord's Supper to consider one another. And it, not really Lord's Supper, but in Hebrews chapter 10, where it talks about when we gather together, don't forsake gathering together. But he says to consider one another. The reason we need to gather together is that hopefully others are thinking about us, considering us. We all need some people around us that think about us and what we're going through and how they can help us. And all of us have, all of us have connections to people that not everybody else has. Thirdly, think clearly. This is the idea of sober-minded, but it means to think clearly. Think factually. Think what's true, what's right, what's real. And, and this, is, this is why things that, you know, what we call psychotropic uh, substances, you know, alcohol and certain drugs, not every drug is psychotropic. Not every drug affects the ability to think clearly, uh, but, but lots of drugs do. They, they affect our ability, you know, to think uh, clearly and understand. Um, and so that's why it's such a, a problem. If we're trying to think clearly, we have to be careful about substances that can affect that. But he's not just talking about that we're not getting drunk or, or, or high on things. He's talking about not being, you know, tricked into believing the lies that Satan gives us. Romans chapter 1 talks about not believing the philosophies and being defrauded by the philosophies that come from the world that sound reasonable or plausible. He says, we need to be careful of those as well to think clearly, to think about what's really real, what's really true. Resist firmly. Got to fight. Got to fight it. Can't just give in. Got to fight it. Got to pray. Got to talk to God. Because there's nobody who will ever understand the temptations you go through like God. Even you. And especially nobody else. Nobody will ever fully get what you are going through. But God knows. And you need to talk to them. Be on watch. That's what we are. We are children of the day, right? And when nighttime comes, when the temptations come, we need to have watchmen set that are ready to kind of go, uh-oh, there's trouble. There, there's where it's coming from. Got to be careful. We need to look at our life that way. Where, where are the issues in our life that are creating the difficulties for us. 
and we'll look at it some more in, in the coming weeks. And sometimes, even if we don't, don't like it, we have to set them aside. We've got to put things away that are not good for us, even if we like it. Even if it's not necessarily sinful, but it's harming us. It's hurting us from walking with God. To be on watch, to think about it. And if you think about it in your own life, if you, if you get the time, I would encourage this. If you get the time in, in this next week, to just write down, what are your danger points? What are the things in your life that others should know about? That are your things that you, you know, these are the things that get to me. These are the things that make me struggle. You should know what they are. You should understand what they are. Think about them. What are they? And how can you get help from others, your brethren? How can you pray about them? Know them. You can't be watchful if you don't know what you're trying to guard, what you're trying to prevent. So we're going to stop there, appreciate your time, and we'll look at some more things that scriptures talk about that, that, that are danger points for us. The things that we have to, the reason we have to put on the whole armor of God to protect us from. And so we, I started with temptation and sadness, isolation there. But we're going to look at some other things scriptures talk about as well. But as we close this morning, I appreciate your time. We're going to sing this song to close out uh, this portion of this morning's services. Um, and if you're here and in need in some way, we say this all the time, but we really mean it. If you are having temptation problems, having sin problems, if you're struggling in some way, and we can help you, we want to. And if you're willing and able, reach out to us. You can come forward. We can let everybody know, pray about, you, pray about it, find help for you. But if you want to just grab somebody privately or talk to us you know, separately, that's great as well. But if we can serve you in any way, we would like to do that. Let's go ahead and stand and sing. Oh,